Thank you for downloading this podcast from Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more podcasts and more information on your number one news and talk station, please visit 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. Stand up for the law. Stand up for decency. Stand up for compassion. Stand up for respect. Stand up for your community. Stand up for your future. Stand up for South Africa. Lead SA. .co.za The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clubby. Chris, how lovely to chat to you. Welcome. Reedy, Happy New Year and Happy New Year to everyone your end. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and I understand it's Thomas's birthday as well. Happy birthday, Thomas. And there's no food in the studio, so it's not a happy birthday for it's him. because he's already yet. eaten it all. <laughs> Anyway, Chris, uh, lots of SMSs and emails that continue to come through throughout the festive season. And in fact, let's open our lines right now on 021-446-0567, 011 I've got an, uh, I'm taking your SMSs, 31702 and 31567. Chris, I've got an email here from somebody who wants to know, has the controversy around uh, the risk of using a cell phone regularly been clarified? Uh, it's a long email, but to this person, James, says, uh, he notices that when he's been on the phone for a very, very long time and he gets off the phone, the screen is very, very hot. What does that mean? It makes him nervous. Mobile phones use microwaves, which are a form of light or, or a form of radio wave, really. They're slightly different wavelength to radio waves. And they send those signals to communicate with a base station which is part of a cellular network, and that base station on the cellular network then interfaces your communications with uh, phone lines and sends them around the world for you. So the phone is in a constant conversation, electrically speaking, with the base station, and the base station is continuously talking to the phone, so information is flowing in both directions. Now, when the phone is on standby, or it's just on receive mode, it's just listening. And the base station occasionally gets a message back from the phone to say where it is. But when you want to have a conversation, the phone has to maintain a constant output of information, which is your conversation being beamed back to the base station. And it's also receiving the incoming radiation from the base station. And to make sure that the signal is received well and faithfully by the base station, the phone not only puts out a signal continuously, but it also increases the power of that signal. Mm. On days where the weather is wet because microwaves are strongly absorbed by water, then you will find that the phone will up the power that it puts out because it's got to make sure that the base station can hear it and that means that it will increase the, the intensity of the microwave radiation that goes out. And these factors all contribute to the phone consuming more energy from the battery and some of the energy it consumes will be running the transmitter in the phone. Other parts of the energy will go into the electrics inside the phone. So some of that heat that's produced is being produced by the fact that there's a screen, there's other bits of electronics inside the phone working. But a proportion of it will be the microwave transmitter running. Therefore, um, it will have a, a local heating effect against your face, but also the microwaves going through your head because the microbes will penetrate the bone of your head just as well as they will penetrate the brick wall of your house. This means that there will be a degree of microwave energy being beamed into your brain, and there will therefore be a, a heating effect inside the brain. Models that I've seen suggest mm -hmm. that this should contribute to a heating effect of maybe one degree C inside the head at most, which shouldn't be pathological. The other thing that's put forward reassuring me by people who make mobile phones mm. is that the energy in a microwave or the radiation of a microwave is not sufficient to break the bonds between atoms in molecules and therefore this is not dubbed ionizing radiation. Although microwaves make molecules, especially molecules of water, shake around, which is why they have a heating effect, they are insufficiently energetic to pull apart the molecules so they don't actually break bonds and therefore they can't damage your DNA and therefore there should be a low risk of cancer. That said, we've only been really exposed to microwave use on the scale that we have with mobile phones for a relatively short time. Mm. And what people are now doing is setting up huge studies around the world where they are gathering data from mobile phone users, with their permission of course, and they are correlating the intensity of that person's phone use with their health outcomes. And this is an ongoing study which has only launched in the last few years all around the world to see if we can tie together any pattern between people's phone use 
and the regularity and exposure to phone use yes. and what it does to their health. On a sort of slightly more remote scale, what other people have done is to look at the overall cancer statistics. This is obviously making the assumption that maybe mobile phones will do something to your cancer risk. And they've looked at the number of people getting cancers in the years leading up to the introduction of mobile phones. And they've now been looking at the rates of cancers in the years after the introduction of mobile phones to see if there's any change. So far, there is not convincing, compelling evidence to show that there is an association. But again, it's early days, and if you look at smoking, which we all accept is a very established risk for getting lung cancer, mm. it actually takes you a lifetime of smoking to get lung cancer. So we might just be looking too soon to see an effect oh. with mobile phone use. So the jury is out, and I think most people say... If you can avoid it, use your mobile phone only when it's necessary. Um, I don't think there's any good compelling evidence that using hands-free devices like on a wire make a difference to your radiation exposure, but a Bluetooth device might, although that still is using a kind of radio wave to communicate between the phone and the handset. But minimise your use, and in young people, try not to use a phone if possible because the skull bones of a young person are thinner than an adult and therefore the penetration of the radiation into the brain... Mm is going to be greater. And there may also be other behavioural effects of being exposed to radiation into your brain from a microwave source that we don't know about yet. So, again, the jury is out, so it's better to just use your mobile phone only as much as you need to rather than uh, live on it. OK. Let's go to Jennifer. Jennifer in four is Hi. Hi. Good morning to both of you. Mm. I've got a question... <laughs> A, a, a year ago, I had a lump, lumpectomy to remove a small lump in my breast, and everything's fine, okay? I then had to have radiation treatment afterwards for about a month, and it's almost like getting sunburned, and it can be quite uncomfortable. I was given cortisone cream, but I was also told to use corn flour, or we call it maizena, to you sort of put it on your breast, and it actually soothes that burning feeling. I want to know why. Yes, I had a friend who had a lymphoma, Jennifer, and Happy New Year, by the way, and I'm glad everything's been sorted out for mm. you. And he also had radiotherapy, and he was using things like talcum powder and corn flour on his skin. Um, I don't know the physiological reason why that works, but he said it gave him quite a lot of relief as well. Uh, I can only think that maybe it stops the skin getting damp from the sweat that gets produced locally and that this may prevent the skin sticking together or it uh, may actually help to stop the sweat irritating the skin and keep the bugs from growing um, because you are more at risk of getting a bacterial infection in skin that may have been damaged by the radiation from the radiotherapy. But what I'll do is I'll take a look into that because um, I'd forgotten all about his treatment and why he did that, so I'll take a look into it. It's reminded me to, to find out why that is. All right, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, Fanny, you are calling us from Gugule to in Cape Town. Hi, Fanny. Hi, uh, morning. Can you speak up, please, Fanny, and ask your question, yeah? Morning and compliments of the season to you and Chris. Thank you. Uh, I want to know, can you tell me, why do a dog, when he, when he goes to sleep, make a turnaround and use the same, same pattern when he goes in poo? That is what I want to know. Okay, I didn't understand the question, but Chris, no, uh, maybe... Wh when a dog, dog goes down to sleep, he first makes a turnaround. Okay. And if he goes in poo... He does the same circle, but why does he do that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, usually when dogs are going to go to the loo, they're actually looking for a space to do it in, and they want somewhere where it's going to be nice and clear so that they can squat down safely without the risk of something biting them on the ghoulies putting it in delicately. So they'll go around in a circle to make sure that there's no spiky things and that there are no animals or things that might bite them. And so by trampling around in a circle, they're making sure that their bum is not, which is quite a vulnerable bit of any of us, let's face it, uh, is not going to get bitten or, st or scratched or stung. You'd do the same. When they mm -hmm. go to bed, they turn around in circles in their bedding because it's a, a good way of doing exactly the same thing. In the same way they would trample the undergrowth down when they're about to go to the loo, uh, they can trample their bedding down to push it into a nice, plush, soft, receptive area for them to curl up in. And I reckon that's the reason. 
All right. Thank you very much, Fanny. What an interesting observation. Let's that's go good, to. That's a good question. I like that one. Yeah, I haven't even observed. I haven't observed that in dogs myself. But geez, Fanny, thank you very much. Interesting. Uh, Frank in Polsov. Hi. Oh, hi. Morning to you. Mm, morning. Oh, uh, Chris. Morning to you. Um, what I'd like to know is there any sub uh, substance or material that with with which one can cover an object that is transparent to the eye, but uh, opaque to a camera. Are you talking about something which um, you could hide a material behind, or are you talking about something which would look like you, you should paint be able to it see on, through it, but you couldn't? Yeah, you can paint it on, or maybe get something glass-like that you could cover the, the object with. As I say, you can see through, but you can't photograph. Okay. Well, there, there are certainly materials that would do something similar. I can only give you a sort of converse example, but it'll explain how we could potentially find something like that. And then maybe someone can suggest another material. Um, we were doing quite an interesting experiment. When we came to South Africa for the SciFest in 2009, we brought with us a webcam that we had modified. And if you take a normal webcam you have on your computer and you look inside it, you'll see that where the lens is that lets the light in, behind that is a special filter. And that filter screens out infrared. And the reason for that is that the chip in the camera, which converts the light waves into electrical signals that go to the computer, is sensitive not just to visible light that we can see, but also to infrared heat. Uh, energy that we can't. So they put a filter in the front of the camera so that when the light with the infrared in it comes through, the infrared gets screened out by the filter and only the visible light goes onto the chip. Otherwise it distorts the image. But if you take out that filter, then you have a camera which can see in the infrared. And if you put some polarizing lenses to screen out instead the visible light on the front of the camera, you can make a camera that sees just in the infrared. And we were playing with this thing, thinking it was all very funny, mm -hmm. until Dave, who works with us, picked up a, a bottle of Coca-Cola and shone the webcam at the bottle of Coca-Cola, which to us, using visible light, looks like a black liquid, doesn't it? And to infrared, it's completely transparent. And we were really gobsmacked to see that you've got this liquid which looks completely clear and colourless in the infrared. So infrared energy just goes straight through. And then we started looking at the plastic cases of a number of devices like your household shaver or the toothbrush packet and that kind of thing. And we found, again, that although they look opaque and they look like there is a solid layer there to the visible light regime, in the infrared they are completely transparent. So materials that have the characteristics you describe do exist, um, but I don't know of any which you could see through with visible light, but which a camera wouldn't see through, because the camera, of course, is looking at visible light as well as you're looking at visible light to take the picture, unless you had a camera that was taking a picture in, say, infrared, um, and you were looking, obviously, in the visible light regime. But such, such substances do exist that can discriminate between different wavelengths of light like that. Thank you very much, Frank. Now, Chris, I have an answer for Fanny. Someone has sent us an SMS to say, Chris, the dog turns twice because one good turn deserves another. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Norman, uh, yes. Round of applause for that one. Stunning. It's from uh, a listener called Brian in Pretoria. Norman in Wildrow Park, hi. Was it one yeah. good turn or one good turd, did he say? Turn. Okay. Yeah. Uh, morning, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Brian. <laughs> I, think, I think I must be stupid, but one of the things that's always puzzled me is uh, the planets all orbit the sun, uh, I believe. And why does the sun stay in the same position? Why doesn't the sun in the universe move around like planets? Uh, Hi, the, Brian. The sun just stops it. Okay, okay, we got Okay, that. well, uh, the sun relative to us does appear to be staying still. You're absolutely right. And the Earth and all of the other clutch of planets in our solar system orbit around the sun. But if you look at the sun and our position relative to other fixed objects, what we call fixed objects, in the universe, you see that they are changing. And in fact, what we now know is that the sun, rather like the Earth is on a giant journey around the sun, the sun is on a giant journey around our galaxy. And unlike the Earth taking one year to go around the sun, the sun takes 
hundreds of millions of years to make its orbit around the centre of our galaxy. So you were right to question this because, in fact, stars are all in their own orbits, in their own galaxies, and so they are moving. And you can see this by comparing their position relative to other objects in the background, which change. Thank you very much, Norman. Celia in Kenilworth. Hi, good morning to both of you. Mm. Welcome to 2012. I use a toothpaste which is white. And it has a blue and a red stripe in it. And no matter how much I demolish the tube, the stripes still come out not mixed with the white. How do they get the stripes <laughs> in the toothpaste? I know it's, it's amazing, isn't it, Celia? Because mm. I've done the same thing. Tubes of toothpaste that go in my luggage that get a really good kicking at the hands of the airlines and booted around the, 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 the strip and all that kind of thing. And you, you find uh, your toothpaste tube is on the verge of rupturing in your luggage and when you squeeze the toothpaste out it's still got a red stripe a blue stripe and a white stripe or whatever it is and uh, a friend of mine actually said i'm convinced there's different compartments in these toothpaste tubes and so he opened one up and he was very shocked to see there weren't there's just tubes of there's, well there's just strips inside the tube of different colored toothpaste and i think the reason is that when you squeeze the tube and someone who has a uh, qualification in fluid dynamics can correct me if I'm wrong or, or help me out here. I think the reason is that when you squeeze the tube, there's no net force being applied just onto the coloured bits mm -hmm. in one direction. And so as a result, they don't get uh, pushed any more than the stuff near them, so they don't change their position relative to the stuff near them, so they tend to stay reasonably in the place that the toothpaste manufacturer put the blue bit and the red bit and the white bit in amongst all the white. Uh, you can actually, if you really work hard, you can mess it up. Um, we did do this as a sort of mini experiment. If you get to the end of a tube of toothpaste and you give it a really good pounding, you can get a very distasteful looking mixture. Um, which looks a bit like a fruit yogurt, actually, because mm. <laughs> of the, the range of colours. Um, but have a go and see if you see if you can mix it up. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's the reason that I've given. But I will also ask my friend, who um, also knows a little bit about these sorts of fluid behaviours, if if I'm right. Let's take a break. We'll be back in a moment. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clubby. Chris Sandy has sent us an email. He says, I wonder whether Chris would set the ball rolling for research into an exciting area, whether donating blood can encourage weight loss by stimulating the metabolism. Tell me about that, Chris. Is that possible? Mm, it would be hard to explain exactly why that would happen. When you donate blood, you're giving a fairly small amount of liquid, about half a litre or so, a pint. And the immediate effect will be therefore a loss of weight because you'll have lost maybe 500 mils of liquid from your circulation and that will weigh half a kilo 500 mils no. is 500 grams but that's mainly all water more than half of that is water about 45 percent of that will be blood cells and so more than half of that loss will be immediately made up because you will provoke a sense of thirst your brain is continuously monitoring the volume of blood in circulation and how concentrated it is and it will immediately make up the volume by making you feel thirsty and also telling your kidney not mm. to throw away so much water um, to make up the cells you need some proteins and you will need some other constituents in your diet to replace those cells and so you will have lost some energy but relative to the amount of energy that the average person takes in in a day over a week over a month and so on it will be so trivial mm. that you'd have ended up completely exsanguinated before you'd actually lost very much weight i'm afraid <laughs> so a better strategy would be to eat slightly less and maybe go for a run <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, it seems like an extraordinary length to go to, to to go into the blood donor clinic in order to slim down that said giving blood is very important because it saves lives absolutely. and um, people absolutely should do that especially if they're like me and they have group O negative blood because mm. you're the universal donor and you can give it to anybody. Yeah. Uh, Sandy, I'm afraid the same, same story. No easy way out. Jim and It's an interesting TS. question there. <laughs> <It is. laughs> we want to cut corners here. Peter in Fishhook, hi. Hi, Reedy. Chris. Mm. Um, cows, bovine, do they absorb they eat plants, okay, but do they absorb the cellulose directly or do they convert the cellulose into a protein like ants? You know, ants farm? Yes, hello, Peter. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Um, cows, although people think cows eat grass, cows don't eat grass. They actually huh? eat bacteria. Are you kidding um, me? I've always you thought might say, cows What's this eat all about? grass. 
Um, yeah, well, what cows are doing and what the ants that Peter refers to are doing, um, cows have m a, a large number of stomachs because they're actually a giant fermenting vessel for bacteria. So the cows eat grass, they actually consume the grass and put it into their stomach, but then all of the digestion of that grass is actually done by microorganisms, and these microorganisms are endowed with enzymes, effectively molecular knives and forks, that will break down the constituents in the grass, including the cellulose, the tough stuff that we can't digest, that Peter refers to, and this then makes the bacteria grow and produce proteins and other micronutrients. The cows then break down the bacteria, and it's the goodies in the bacteria that the cows are eating. Leaf cutter mm ants cut leaves but they don't eat leaves they feed a fungus in their nest with the leaves and the fungus breaks down the leaf proteins and the leaf uh, carbohydrates and the celluloses and produces more fungal tissue and it's the fungus that the ants eat so in that regard ants are rather like cows interesting christine in centurion you are last caller for the morning what's your question hi guys mm. i've been looking after my daughter's african gray over christmas holidays and we normally have him perhaps once or twice a year but what fascinates me is he remembers all our names, he remembers my dog's names, he calls them to the cage and then tells them to go away. So I was understanding <laughs> there's comprehension, there's understanding, there's recognition, you can have a conversation. If we descended from apes, why then don't apes have the gift of speech and conversation like a bird does? <laughs> well, hello, Christine. Um, I think that the reason is that birds use song and sound very much to attract and communicate and to mate. And when you have a pet like a bird, I mean, birds are very intelligent. And Nikki Clayton, who works with us here in Cambridge, works on uh, scrub jays, a member of the crow family, and does all these amazing experiments showing that they can work out really quite complicated problems, and they can work it out between them. So rather than just one solving it themselves, they can actually work together to solve problems. She calls them feathered Einsteins. Mm. But, but they probably use sounds um, to their advantage and they have the ability to, to develop complicated sounds because of the importance of song in their communication and mating life, lifestyle, the, the sort of reproductive cycle. And they're just because they're intelligent, they can subvert their auditory and audio abilities to do other things with it. And I think that's probably what's going on. There was quite an interesting study that got done in America a year or so ago where they're actually able to show that birds will recognise individual people. And this group sent a researcher in their group to go and annoy a bird in its nest. Um, I can't remember exactly what kind of bird it was that it was annoying, but he had to go and annoy this bird. And the bird obviously went nuts. Uh, the next time he went to the nest, the bird went even more nuts. The next time he went to annoy this bird, it went really, really, really wild and was threatening. Then they said, OK, Okay, if the bird just assumes that all humans are the same, if we send a different person to now go and annoy this bird, it should, because it's so wound up, just go absolutely crazy. So they sent a, a lady from their research group in to go and annoy the bird, and it reacted as though it did the first time the guy went to go and annoy it. So it could clearly discriminate between uh. one person and another. So birds don't just discriminate between other birds, they can also tell humans and other species apart. Yeah. And that's how your bird is being able to say, right, okay, I'll make this noise for this one, this noise for this one. And birds are clever. So they're just using this, this sound ability that it has and the other recognition abilities they have, because they're very visual animals too, in order to, to have fun. Interesting. Thank you very much, Christine, and have fun with the bird. Have a lovely weekend, Chris. I'll chat to you next week. Thanks, really. Happy New Year, everyone, and see you next time. Bye-bye. And that conversation with the Naked Scientist will be available as a podcast. It's 10 o'clock.